All right, ladies and gentlemen, what's up? It's Obscenity. I'm back with um, a continuation of the video I released earlier this week. This is going to be part two of the review of the Smith Plays sort of mini documentary called The Fall of Call of Duty Zombies. Um, a couple of notes before I start. First off, in between episodes, I got a noise gate from my mic. Um, I'm aware it's still not perfect, but I really hope it helps sort of clear out my voice and drain some of the background noise. I know that's been an issue. Um, also, we're going to be trying to keep this one shorter. And, um, you know, due to the nature of the content I'm making, my express goal, essentially, in making all these videos is to throw a different voice into the zombies community, right? Uh, not necessarily to agree or disagree, not to witch hunt the big YouTubers for their opinions, uh, nothing like that, not to witch hunt even any individual members of the community, but while I'm on, you know, sort of, what while I'm doing work officially under the channel brand, what I want to be doing is trying to just sort of raise awareness of both some facts that are commonly overlooked and some different perspectives. So if you appreciate the video, I would really appreciate it if you, you know, drop the link to a friend, share it on Reddit. Uh, I share my own, I upload Reddit posts whenever I upload these videos to the Call of Duty Zombies subreddit. So again, I'd appreciate if you would like share those around. Or of course you can drop a dislike, drop a like, I don't really care. Um, I'm just trying to, you know, bring a sort of different set of, or bring a different mindset to the pre-existing zombies community. Uh, but before we get started with the video, I also wanted to give you guys just a quick reminder. When we left off last time, Smith had mentioned that there was an X factor in Treyarch Zombies. I had argued that that wasn't true. And um, as we continue this first bit here, what we're gonna see is Smith uh, discussing his feelings about the mistakes in Black Ops 4's design. Um, in addition to touching, I think, more heavily than he has before on the issue of corporate greed, which, if you remember, is one of the issues that I stated in the first episode I really wanted to focus in on as we continue this series. Uh, with that out of the way, I think we're going to go ahead and get to the video. I have the same point of attention with this that I do to the introduction to Tim's hands instead of the night video. Uh, that being, the language is in this section is conveying what is subjective as something that's objectively true. So, the statement that Black Ops 4 is an example of how not to make a zombies game is probably factually incorrect, especially considering there's no handbook for making a zombies game to begin with. There's no sort of set pattern, there's no pre-existing measure to deviate from. This is Treyarch, this is the studio that started Zombies in Call of Duty. So really, they're the ones who define the game mode, not the community and not anybody else. And as a result, especially they should be given creative freedom to do whatever they want with it. This is mentioned in part one, and I mean I'll mention this a couple more times, is likely due to originality. Treyarch was the company that first made zombies big. When something gets big, naturally the clones come. Think about all the knockoff fidget spinners, maybe think about the knockoff hoverboards, or think about even all of the phones that run on Android operating software that aren't Android phones. Um, and, you know, each of those clones usually finds its place. They each kind of cement a location inside the market, but they never actually reach the sort of pedestal or they never really challenge the original for its spot at the top, right? And the same thing happened with zombies. It's not to say that all of the other modes that came, all of the other non-survival modes that came as a result of zombies are bad. It's just they don't quite... 
you know, because they aren't original, because they're stealing an idea, they rightfully so shouldn't be taking the throne from the original idea. This point is mentioned again later, but I feel obligated to note the maps aren't actually bad. They have their ups and downs, but if we're taking this subjectively, in the current state of the game, there are mostly ups. The game is relatively stable, the weapon pool is diverse, um, you know, the boss zombies provide different sets of strategies, they provide different sets of challenges to your round by round gameplay, keeping it exciting uh there are buildables that all work the parts all spawn and you know just overall these four launch maps in their current state probably couldn't be considered objectively bad um just from from a purely gameplay from a purely design standpoint that being said on launch i would agree they were pretty bad um you know the early game crashes the parts not rendering in the fact that you had to go down to get one of the parts for the shield upgrade on 9. By the way, fun fact, there's a shield upgrade on 9. Um, these were all things that were, you know, pretty obviously and rightfully counted against the maps. But again, this video was released after the release of DLC 4. Hang on, we can actually just check this right now. Yes, it was released September 29th, 2019, which is well... Actually, that's about a year exactly after the game came out. So we should have seen DLC 4 by then, right? We would have been looking forward. And, you know, it. for when this video was made, it's important to recognize that the maps aren't, subje or aren't objectively bad. Maybe in, maybe, like, in an opinion poll they're bad, but, again, objectivity isn't necessarily fact. Subjectivity aside, it's important to remember, like I just said, the game came out in a fractured state, and it's since received many graphical updates, many lighting updates, um, that sort of patched that together across the maps. It's not perfect, don't get me wrong, if you want to see the imperfections, look at Dead of the Night, look at the skyboxes, look at the cutscenes, and especially when you play Dead of the Night in cartoon mode, you will see a lot, and I mean a lot of graphical bugs. But... Again, it's still a lot better at le or it's still a lot better than it was at launch. But still though, I mean the community could have gotten over graphics if everything else was good. Fortunately, that was not the case. Another big issue was just the engine itself. Things again felt worse or no better than Black Ops 3. This is impossible. I'm sorry to argue a point so bluntly. But I'll spare the depth of the nerd stuff that I dove through figuring this out. Suffice to say, both Black Ops 3 and 4 were built on version 3 of the IW engine. IW not standing for, um, IW more likely standing for Infinity War than Infinite Warfare here, by the way, just for clarity. Um, this means that they both have the same upper limits. They both have the same design restrictions. They were both created using the same environments. And they both had the exact same potential for movement systems. The likely mistake here, the likely sort of conflation with the movement, if I may take a guess, is the, is the HUD. There's a lot. The HUD takes up a much larger part of the screen. I mean, here, I think we actually just saw a clip of... Yeah. 
Look at the HUD on Shadows right here, right? And there we go. Now we're back to this HUD. Look at massive, massive health and points, massive perk bars, right? It's all so much bigger. What that's going to do is that's going to condense the size of the screen that's actually free to play the game, and that's going to make the field of view feel smaller. Now, if you've ever played with field of view settings in a video game, a closer FOV makes you feel like you're moving slower. A larger FOV makes you feel like you're making more progress at any one time. In reality, of course, the movement in game doesn't change, but again, my guess is that that sort of HUD restriction on the sort of open space of the game um, just makes the game feel slower overall, which is what's then mistaken to be an issue with uh, the engine. Uh, to bring up another point sort of against this, because, you know, I've already mentioned a, a variety of reasons that the game could have felt clunky, but the zombie servers haven't been incredible ever. They've never really truly been able to keep up with um, just the pure volume of stuff to load for each zombie's map, the pure, the pure volume of map that the game needs to track. I mean, like, the denizens exist because transit was too big for old-gen consoles, okay? Um, and especially as the maps get newer, keeping in mind that transit would now be an easy load on, on a PS4 compared to 9, compared to Voyage, um, what you get is you get some consistent issues, some consistent sputtering with the maps, or inconsistent but still, like, omnipresent, and, uh... When you combine that with the launch stability of the game, with just how buggy, how sort of torn apart, like the, the shreds of maps that were released, it's more likely, given the fact, especially if the engine didn't change, that the servers were struggling to load the maps and still are struggling to load the maps. Because when you rush the foundation of coding something, everything that you build on top of it is also going to be shaky, right? And so... Um, logic would lead to the conclusion that since the maps were built on shaky ground, the code isn't, con isn't executed consistently time and time again, and that causes a second issue for the servers to handle beyond just the normal connection loading, uh, potentially host router issues. You know, the set of issues that we've known about for years, even as casual gamers, that are basically summed up as ping. Lundell explained this, the clip for which should be shown later in this very video. None of the crutch perks were actually removed. The intent was never to remove them. There were some statistics gathered on the games. The pick rate for Jug was 100% outside of the challenge runs where players were specifically not using Jug. And Quick Revive had a very near 100% pick rate among solo players. It's therefore logical to assume going forward that all players can benefit from the perks, right? Like, everybody wants them, so why wouldn't you build them into the character? Why is it not a logical step forward to say, if everybody does this anyways, we may as well just make it something for them to do, so that they have creative freedom in other places, like the two perk slots that are now opened up, because we aren't carrying extra revives in Juggernaut every game. And this isn't to say that there couldn't be like a challenge, an easter egg, a lockdown, or even just like a soul chest you need to fill to get Juggernaut. Like, even if you as the player had to like charge up a shield with like 100 kills or something before you got your extra hit, just so that it wasn't instant, right? Um, it would still be something that was added to the character so that like the players could choose more creative perks or perks with more pizzazz. This is likely a de uh, this is likely a tongue slip, guys. I'm j just straight up. I couldn't ignore it, but it's likely a tongue slip. Deadshot's still in the game. It has been in the game since launch, 
And in my opinion, the Black Ops 4 version of Deadshot is actually significantly better. This is the first, honestly, this is the first Call of Duty Zombies game that I have ever bought Deadshot in or ever put Deadshot on my perk loadout in consistently. Um, it's an incredible perk in this game, and I think it does so much more under the new perk system than it ever did under the old ones. Um, especially considering you would be sacrificing something like Speed Cola or Double Tap to pick up Deadshot. They've been changed. That's a fact. They're not the same as they were. But to say that they've been changed weirdly is incredibly subjective. Especially because, like, the only real change to the way Mule Kick works is that the modifier stores your third weapon. So if you have Mule Kick in your Odin slot, or... Is it Brew? Or... I don't know the names for the Aether maps. I'm sorry, I don't, I don't play them as often, I'll just admit it. But your fourth perk slot on an Aether map... When you go down and lose Mule Kick, and then you get up and buy it again, you'll have the same third weapon you had before. So it alleviates the issues one that we had, or that a lot of people had with Mule Kick before, which is like if you have a decent third weapon and you just lose it, that kind of feels bad. Um, and of course, Electric Cherry functions the exact same as it did before, unless you modify it again. In which case, it electrifies your knife, which I mean, cool, I guess. But, again, the core perk, if you just put it on your loadout, doesn't change. Right? So, it's not that... Oh, also, stamp... Wait. Stamina Up is the same, too. The only perk on that list that was actually changed was Quick Revive. Because Stamina Up has even seen an infinite modifier before in Black Ops 2's perma perk system. Um, but, you know, any, enough of that. Let's get back to the video. We'll talk about Quick Revive in just a minute here. Quick Revive, most notably, now only rests two mates faster, but in solo, you would simply auto-spawn with Speed Revive. As compared to the traditional system of two to perk to charge every time you down. <laughs> For the amount of time Smith has spent talking about perks, I can't take it. I'm just done with this. This may be a personal opinion, this entire next little section. But there is not a world in which having a physical quick revive machine was better than having built-in revives, okay? The two differences between the built-in revives and the quick revive machine were, number one, you had to pay points for your revives, and number two, you had to go back to a single location every time you wanted your, your revive. Now, those revives cost 500 each, the sum of a maximum of seven body shot kills, five kills if you hit headshots, and four melee kills with no other point optimization. You can actually pull it down to three kills if you put eight shots in and then melee. But, um... So, you know, the points were ne never an object, right? 500 points, the most that would ever set you back was, like, opening a door around later. Which has never been the end of the world in Zombies. It's never been the difference between ending the game and, and staying in it. Especially for the players who are maximizing points to that degree anyways and likely don't need to buy Quick Revive before the entire map is open. Um, and beyond that, when you have Quick Revive, when you have the machine tied to a single location, you completely interrupt the flow of solo gameplay for a down. Right? Like, as if downs don't already slow down the game enough and force you out of the sort of I'm running around killing zombies, I'm a badass mode. To throw on top of that, needing to take time out of whatever you were doing, easter egg steps, weapon upgrades, etc., even just surviving rounds to run back and pick up the perk, is, like, it's, it's a, a change in gameplay pace that, as a developer, I wouldn't want in my game because it does truly feel unnecessary. Um, beyond that, if you compare that to the new Quick Revive with faster health regen, regening teammates, and even a speed boost for reviving people if you, um, if you haven't modified, which by the way pairs very, very well with the Ballistic Knife, um, I don't, I, I think it's a blow away case, honestly. I really believe that this argument is just, like... It's just wrong. Like, in my opinion, it's just wrong to say that the Quick Revive machine was better than the new Revive system. And, you know, I just laid out those things, or those reasons. 
but the implementation of quick revives into the character should be an unequivocal improvement because again it improves gameplay it say or it improves the flow of gameplay it saves points and it prevents map regression right and i don't know what more you could ask for out of a gameplay change made in any video game not just call of duty zombies This may be true, but it's intentional and it shouldn't be held against the developers. There's clearly consideration of the players, right? When we add all four of the crutch perks in as player class abilities, that's that that is a way of the de that's a way for the devs to say that, you know, they're looking out for their players because again, if all four of those perks have over a 75% pick rate, there's no reason not to include them, right? And Beyond that, this is a consideration of the fact that people play differently, right? I'm going to just name some common strategies I can think of, right? Some things that people like doing that not everybody likes doing. You know, some people enjoy the catwalk. Some people enjoy full map trains on Barak, Shangri-La, the more cramped circles of Shadows of Evil, Zetsubu. Or, you know, even there are a lot of people who just love sitting there spinning around in circles like they're in an action movie, like just holding off the hordes as friends, right? Like, they've got three friends, you're sitting in a circle in spawn, like, this, like the original Zombies trailers, just guns blazing, mowing down as much as you can and trying to keep yourself safe, right? The perk system in Black Ops 4 was developed around an understanding that people have those different play styles. Whereas before, in any of those cases, you would want Juggernaug, you would probably want widow's wine you might want speed cola phd right there are a number or juggernaut um quick revive speed cola double tap for example would work in any of those cases right there was no need to change up your your gameplay based on the style um whereas like in this game death perception it, you know if you're sitting in a circle with a bunch of your friends death perception allows you to call zombies that are sneaking up on your friends It'll give you an advanced warning of mini bosses that, you know, require you to focus team fire. Uh, and of course, with good communication, takes up a total of one of the 16 perk slots available in game. That is four people with four perk slots, by the way. Um, Bandolier keeps your clips full, giving some weapons as many as 300 extra shots. And that's only the beginning of the creativity, right? So, like, you really see in Black Ops 4 the ability to, like, if you're going to be sitting in, if you know that you're the kind of person to just spin in circles and shoot as much as you can, death perception is going to be the perk for you. It's going to give you a warning when something's sneaking up behind you. If you're the kind of person to camp on the catwalk, Stone Cold Stronghold is going to be for you, right? Uh, if you're the kind of person to, you know, run longer trains, run full map trains, you're going to want stamina up. And if you're running short trains, you're going to want Winter's Whale. Um... It, there are different perks now for different play styles, and I don't understand how I, I truly, like, by the way, everything I've stated before is just fact. It's based on the perk abilities, how they impact your gameplay if you use them properly, correct? Now we're going to skip into an opinion section, just for clarity, that, um... These new perks may not be as strong as just giving you an extra hit, two hits like Juggernaug did, or just straight up doubling your damage like Double Tap did, but they allow so much more creativity that especially when you still have those crutch abilities built into your player, there should be no reason to hate on them. The point of specialists, or the goal of making specialist player kits, was to give unique opportunities to, for, for synergy, okay? Like, 
and that synergy wouldn't pollute the map with four extra side quests assuming you create one for each wonder weapon right so i think we're talking about this again in part three but i may as well mention it now um the staff allows you to revive your teammates with their perks the viper and dragon gives you a deploy gives you a shootable monkey bomb associated with your l1 r1 so you can keep your wraith fires you can keep your acid bombs you can keep your sentry gun if you want the hammer just does damage right the hammer we all know has massive damage output it's as powerful as the wonder Waff should be in black ops 4 and uh the chakrams give you protection they give you the speed boost they give you an aura of death or stagger in the case of mini bosses around you so that you can get out those revives you can get away from sticky situations like they all have unique abilities and they all synergize really well together if you're working with four people and even then if you're not working with four people like i mentioned they all provide amazing solo effects because even the staff once you get to level three if you put it on the ground and you down inside it it'll pick you up with all your perks too so like the specialists were clearly changed but the goal wasn't to make them as like the goal was clearly to to um deviate from the sort of black ops 3 style where they were just for killing and to make them part of a toolkit to make them a useful strategy item that you could deploy throughout the game to help impact the the flow of gameplay and to help sort of mitigate those bosses that constantly force you to change your targeting that i was mentioning earlier While I agree with the statement that the player is overpowered at the start of the game personally, it's important to note that the power change, change seems natural. Most of us who've been playing zombies have been playing anywhere from or playing the game mode for anywhere between three and ten, even up to twelve years, right? We're used to all that progression. We've done it hundreds, if not thousands, maybe even tens of thousands of times. And so I have one question, which is do we all really still need the gauntlet at the beginning of every game? I mean, like, if you can hop onto any map consistently and open it before picking up Jug, do you really need to wait to get Jug anymore, right? If you're gonna just buy Quick Revive as soon as you spawn in on round one, do you really need Quick Revive anymore? Like, it seems natural for the player to get more powerful in these games as time goes on because the player is learning and growing and developing. In addition, the gaming industry is learning and growing and developing, and this is, an, this is more of an opinion, but I'll be honest, video games have gotten easier, okay? Like, I tried to play Pokemon Red and Blue the other day, and I'll be honest, I was lost. Whereas, like, if you play their remakes, Let's Go Pikachu and Let's Go Eevee, the games are easy, they're straightforward, they're relaxing, right? And so to some extent, I think that there was a pressure to make the game easier without completely shafting the hardcore players or the people who already knew what they were doing. And that's where you see the implementation of all the secret rooms, all the extra weapons in Dead of the Night. That's where you see the buildables coming into the map more. That's where you see the pack-a-punch rituals rather than just a free pack-a-punch, right? There are new things for the upper tier of players to focus on that we don't or we shouldn't need to go by jug for the nth time we shouldn't need to be worried about getting quick revive for the millionth time that that original progression at least in my opinion has gotten old and boring and that we need something new and not only that but weaving those four base perks into the character system allows for the hardcore players or the upper tier to still have them to still access them and use them to the full effect they used them before while the softer intro and the slightly more overpowered intro lets new people come into the franchise with more ease.
All right. Based especially on the fact that the, in what is in my opinion, innovative and natural perk system of Black Ops 4 was boiled down to Bandolier, Bandit, and Death Perception being quote-unquote uninteresting and useless, the impact of the core gameplay changes, like I mentioned earlier, the implementation of Specialist, the implementation of Jug at the start, um, is likely overstated. It's, it's likely incredibly overstated. Um, because again, the, uh, the, the view on the perk system was a little bit of a harsh opinion. It wasn't, it, it strayed a little bit from what the development was for. It strayed a little bit from what the changes were for. And it dove a little bit too deep into, this is how I feel versus the original perk system. So again, just keep in mind that this statement likely has the same, um, flair to it. Okay, there's my mouse. Sorry. A kitchen is like a glass of water. <laughs> oh boy. It may be awesome in its own right, but it's not important to zombies as a franchise. This is a subjective example based on the feeling Smith expressed earlier in the video, which is fine. Just be aware that it's not a fact. Just be aware that it's not true. It's purely feeling. In the same way, by the way, that Tim Hansen's feelings on Dead of the Night being like a glass of water are just that, feelings. But in case you're wondering what the glass of water reference was. This is a nitpick. The past tense here implies that the chaos story doesn't exist anymore, which is incorrect. Even if it's discontinued in the next Black Ops game, and even if it's never touched again, the characters, crew, and map will still exist in this game, will still exist as part of the Zombies franchise. You know, just overall, they won't be deleted. There's never a reason to use chaos in past tense. Just like there should never be a reason to use Aether in past tense, even if the story itself is concluded. The exact same thing happened at the start of the Aether story. Feel like I've said this before. Even worse, though... The characters were just societal stereotypes in the beginning of the Aether story. The characters were just Japanese thinks American is fat pig, American likes shotguns and killing things, right? Russian is drunk. And, um, I mean, I guess Richtofen is a unique character. I honestly can't think of a stereotype for him off the cusp. But, um, nevertheless... The characters in Black Ops 4 in Chaos Story have some unique personality, some unique interactions, as opposed to the voice lines I mentioned in Part 1. Um, I honestly believe that for the start of a story, again, this is a personal opinion, but for the start of a story, if we're going to fault any characters, it should be, rightfully, the Aether characters. Um, because while they may have been funny ten years ago... That kind of card would not go over well today, whereas the card, whereas the, you know, sort of actual character and actual connection to losing Scarlet's father that all of those people felt, again, being friends of Alistair, has created a more coherent synergy than for people from different organizations researching Element 115. this 
before. We've been here before. Now, fortunately, there were two other maps that were in the game. Classified was a remake of the old presidential map 5 from Black Ops 1, and Fall of the Dead was the other Aether map. It was a remake of fan favorite from Black Ops 1 the Dead. While gameplay was questionable here... This isn't in my notes, but I love how Blood of the Dead is referred to as the other Aether map. I find that mildly humorous because a lot of people, I'm fairly certain, Smith included, don't like it. And referring to other, referring to something as the other of anything else is generally a way of dismissing it as being worse. Just, just a fun side note. Okay, as evidenced by the rest of the DLC season, which by the way was also split between Chaos and Aether, it confused the development team too. They didn't know where they were taking the story, they didn't know which story they were taking, they didn't know when to do it. And at least in my opinion, this hurt the identity of the game purely for the sake of the fact that there were two completely separate stories in it. It's not that Chaos hurt the game, it's not that Aether hurt the game. It's that the presence of both drew, like, they drew away from each other mutually because they were both there and it was kind of harder. It was harder than it needed to be to track. But the last thing that killed not only the launch, but basically the entire game was just the lack of support from Activision. Now, Activision, I, I honestly hate to blame you. It feels like such a combo between you and me, like, oh, This isn't a cop-out. This is not a cop-out at all. All signs point, point toward two things. Number one, that Activision is responsible for both perceived and tangible issues in Black Ops 4. Number two, that the community collectively owes Blundell and Treyarch a thorough apology for the absolutely vitriolic language that they've used when talking about Black Ops 4, that we as a community have used when talking about Black Ops 4 over the past couple of years. Because this all stems from, as Smith will mention later, a rushed development cycle. Yeah, but it is most definitely your fault when I say that Black Ops 4 was done incredibly early. On launch day, Zombies wasn't even finished. Games would crash at round 20, 15, and sometimes even round 5, making it near unplayable for anyone trying to have a good time. And that's Smith acknowledges it, but I need to double down on it. The game was incomplete at launch. It was released over a month early, a month that otherwise would have gone towards bug testing, towards balance changes, towards patches. The release deadline is set by the publisher, Activision, meaning that all of the issues that sort of plagued zombies throughout the launch cycle and... Ultimately, the issues that bogged down Treyarch from being able to deliver on their promises of update features for zombies were the fault of Activision, not Treyarch themselves. Uh-oh. Hold up, hold up. I missed my cue. I'm sorry, guys. I have notes over here, and I totally missed it. Um, it's bound to happen, though, right? 
uh, back to the Red Dead Redemption conversation for just a second. Um, my personal opinion, the worst part about this is just how different Red Dead is. Campaign is known for 60 plus hours of gameplay in Red Dead. The game is even honestly probably more known for its campaign than its multiplayer at this point. Um, the game is set in the American Midwest. Black Ops 4 is a futuristic FPS. Red Dead is third person most of the time, by the way. And... Wait, is that true? I remember Red Dead having the third person. Hang on. Uh, yes. Red Dead had third person and first person options. Okay. So... Call of Duty, on the other hand, only has first person. First person. Apologies. Um, and Red Dead, this is the worst part. Red Dead on launch was even more broken than Black Ops 4 Zombies, with multiple sources claiming it would take an average of six hours of gameplay in the online mode on a daily basis just to break even. Just to stay where you are, just to keep your camp together, just to keep enough beans in your back pocket, you know, not to make money, but six hours to break even. Okay, that is literally, that would, that like, that literally directly means that Rockstar d designed the game so that you would have to spend a quarter of your life. If you were to play the game for the rest of your life, you would spend a quarter of your life selling beans to keep your economy where it was before. Okay, that is honestly more unplayable than something that crashes. Because most people don't have six hours free, let alone not wanting to spend six hours playing Red Dead 2. So basically, um... The extra production month for Black Ops 4 would have actually likely put it ahead of Red Dead 2. Because, again, Red Dead was actually getting bad press upon release. So, you know, you take the extra month to bug test, etc., and then you drop Black Ops 4 in a, smooth, in a, in a sort of smoothed-out, stable state. And it, should be, or, and it should, at least based on my knowledge of, of how, you know, product quality impacts sales, uh, it would do better. Though, then again, personally, I don't see how Activision could have looked at Red Dead and said, this is going to draw from the Call of Duty market. Because, again, they're such different games. That's a lie. It's just wrong to say that Treyarch or the development team of Zombies at any point cared about money, at any point didn't want a polished experience. They were against microtransactions before everybody else was. I mean, back in Black Ops 3 Zombies, they added Monty's Cookbook. It may have been after the game's life cycle, but Monty's Cookbook allowed free-to-play players to trade up um, to trade up the, you know, normal gobblegum, the higher drop rate gobblegums that they got from playing the game into what were ultimately considered premium consumables. And it was reasonable, too. It wasn't completely busted. Activision... On the other hand, it's a company with no direct involvement in the game beyond money. They're essentially the wealthy benefactor of Call of Duty at this point in terms of budgeting. Did care about the money. And Activision's obsession with the money, obsession with the bottom line, cost the community and the development team excruciating amounts. What's missed in the Zombies community is that it is very much more than likely that the development team suffers with the community. The game has been about passion since the start. We've seen the number of ciphers, the number of tiny Easter eggs, the number of lore hints, right? That kind of lore isn't something that you develop for a money project. That's something you develop for something you're truly passionate about. Okay, that kind of interest. And the development team did that. They put the extra hours into all of that. Whereas Treyarch, or whereas, uh, pardon me, whereas Activision just needed to push out the games, right? So, again, it's not, I, I can't say for certain, but I can say that based on, you know, the evidence shown in this video, all signs point towards Treyarch being just as pained with their game as the community was 
and Activision just pushing it relentlessly for their own purposes. This right here is the crux of the issue of the Catch-22 that the Zombies community puts Treyarch in. The video is a perfect example of the way the community compares games, this entire video that is. As opposed to looking at the improvements mechanically and the growth alongside the player base that Black Ops 4 has made, the leaps and strides ahead of Black Ops 3 that it is, uh, people are comparing the maps, you know, and also it's been worked to make uh, the entry of new players more seamless, right? Meanwhile, the core question asked in the community um, is whether or not the game is better. If it's better than the last one, that's great. If it's worse than the last one, that's awful, right? If it's more ambitious, that's good. But that shouldn't be what's important. The launch state of Black Ops 4 is proof of the fact that we as a community need to back off Treyarch and we need to let them develop their own fucking game, okay? Um... And you need to, uh, and we need to start looking at their maps from a standpoint of gameplay fluidity, from a standpoint of natural progression, from a standpoint of, uh, you know, growth with the player skill, um, as opposed to sitting here comparing them to Shadows of Evil, to Derise and Drock Origins, Mob of the Dead, Ancient Evil, etc. Uh, because if you remember when Shadows of Evil came out, people didn't like it. People said it was too hard for a launch map, that it would turn people away. And if memory serves, there were actually very similar videos coming out about Shadows when the map was first launched. There were very, there were a lot of people saying it was lazy to launch with one map, especially considering like Black Ops 2 had a pseudo four maps and two game modes type of thing going on. Um, you know, there were some people who believed it was a step back. And again, this is a catch-22. Like, the devs are trying to give us what we want. They balanced the perks in Black Ops 4. They made the elixirs less overpowered in Black Ops 4, which were complaints we had in Black Ops 3. And then we complained about that. Um, this is... I, I don't understand it, honestly. I, it's... Like... The, the dichotomy here, I could spend my time compiling evidence on all of this to make a full-length video about the Black Ops Zombies cycle where you see that when every game comes out, everybody hates on it because it's different than the previous game. But if you think about it, I'm sure you can notice the same thing yourselves. And again, we're going to leave off here with the fact that we've put Treyarch in a Catch-22 as a community and we continue to keep them in that Catch-22 and that really... The only way out of this is for us to back off. The only way is to let Treyarch develop a game for us, develop a game mode for us, and to assess that game mode based on its own progression, based on its own merits, not based on the merits of everything that's come before it. Thanks for watching. Again, don't forget to reach me with questions, comments, concerns, rebuttals. I promise for the time being at least that I'll reply to all civil messages civilly. And I'll reply to, you know, any queries, any rebuttals. Like, I'll take the time if you're willing to, okay? With that note, I really hope you guys enjoy the rest of your days. And I'll see you next time.